get this started. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. This is Panama Bartholomew, or good evening, with the Building Decarbonization Coalition. And thank you for joining our webinar series, BDC Presents. Um, we have a fantastic one today, um, how SMUD re-engineered itself to focus on decarbonization through demand flexibility and electrification. And we're so excited that you are able to take a break from your family and join us um, on this and giving you guys an excuse for at least an hour to think about something else uh, besides childcare. So thank you for, for joining us um, on the call today. Um, just what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna provide a little bit of background on the Building Decarbonization Coalition, um, why we do these webinar series. I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Matt Golden with Recurve who will then walk us through today's presentation. So the Building Decarbonization Coalition is a, is a, uh, it's a collection of different organizations representing energy providers, manufacturers, of heating equipment, uh, local governments, the design and construction community, and NGOs. And we all work together to try to eliminate greenhouse gases from the built environment. Uh, we released a roadmap focused on California um, almost a year ago. Um, and that laid out really an, an approach and a pathway for California to take to completely eliminate its emissions. Um, in that, we called for a series of numerical goals that the state should try to meet, including all new construction um, being completely emissions free by 2025 for residential buildings and 2020 for commercial buildings. Um, after last year, that looks actually not anywhere near as ambitious um, as it should be. Um, and then on retrofits, getting us so that our existing building stock by 2045 is completely emissions free. Um, included in there was some numerical goals for the sale of um, key technologies, particularly heat pumps for space heating and water heating that we moved towards a 2030 date of, not, of only selling uh, heat pumps uh, for those purposes in California from then on. Um, following those numerical goals, we also had a series of more um, uh, philosophical goals, um, goals that we know had to be, meet, had to be met if we're going to be able to achieve our, our numerical goals. Um, and so those are up there on the screen for you, but it's um, really building awareness uh, across all, all stakeholders about why electric lifestyle is better, um, ensuring that customers are receiving a good value proposition um, for electrification, making sure that the builders and the installers that are working in this space have a better value proposition on installing all electric rather than installing fossil fuel appliances, um, making sure the supply chain, the barriers are out of the way and they're ramped up to be able to, to meet the demand we're talking about, and then making sure that our policies are actually aligned so that our construction policies, our energy efficiency policies, and other policies aren't out of alignment with our climate policies and holding back building electrification. So um, really the, these webinar series are about this first goal, is to how do we build awareness? And so once a month, sometimes twice a month, with the coronavirus, we're looking at maybe more than twice a month, um, having these webinars where we can bring in really the luminaries in the field, the best thinkers, the best doers, um, the most engaging speakers to talk about what are some of the, the biggest, biggest topics and most cutting edge topics of their time. We do product releases on here, um, we have philosophy on here. We have hardcore design on here. And so um, love to have you come back um, for future webinars to hear from some of these top thinkers and doers in the field. So the way that we're gonna run this today is um, I'm gonna hand it over to Matt. We had over 250 organizations register um, for this webinar. So um, we're gonna keep you all on mute. Um, so if you could please, if you have a question, use the chat feature, um, chat at everyone and uh, ask your question and then Matt will take breaks periodically through the presentation and um, answer those questions. We'll read them to him and he'll answer those questions. Um, we'll finish it up with a little bit of time for questions and answers at the end um, and, uh, and that's how we'll run it. So thank you so much for joining uh, the, the webinar today um, and I'm glad to have you on here and I'm gonna hand it over to, uh, to Matt Golden now to walk us through the presentation. Matt, you should be ready to share. All right, sounds good. Let me uh, get this underway. Appreciate everybody getting on today. We're up over 100 people, which is uh, an awfully good start. I want to just confirm before I go any further that um, in a moment here, hopefully, you can see my screen. 
Is that working for everybody? It's working for everybody and we are recording. Fabulous. All right. Well, really appreciate the interest. This is uh, this webinar represents the culmination, well, actually not the, the culmination of the last, I would say, three years of work with SMUD um, and really the beginning of a, of a new phase of deployment uh, with SMUD, but also generally. Things have obviously progressed. Panama, when we were talking about the building decarb coalition and electrification just a few years ago, I have to admit it seemed a little bit more perspective than it has become rather, rather quickly, and that's awesome. Um, so the work that we've done with SMUD um, has really been important from a recurve standpoint and but I think also in helping shape some of the way SMUD's thinking about their new carbon goals um, and also the relationship between electrification and energy efficiency and grid needs and of course uh, real decarbonization uh, where it counts kind of in real terms. Uh, so we're really you know very thankful that to have had the opportunity to work with SMUD and get access to some data um, on how what the real impacts look like that uh, has been super exciting for us to get to learn about and I think similarly um, really exciting to work with with folks like Scott and Margaret who will introduce shortly um, on the SMUD side as well who uh, really helped us progress and, and learn quite a bit about what the real impacts are and how to really think about holistic systemic uh, decarbonization um, and thanks to you know generally and we're excited and thankfully SMUD is very willing to share a lot of these learnings broadly because uh, uh, some of the data we've been able to accumulate doesn't exist in a lot of places yet so it's it's hopefully something that can help everybody think about kind of holistic system-based strategies so scott blunk uh will will take kind of the first section talking a little bit about uh, smuds transition to decarb goals um and how they're thinking about electrification as, as a key part of that or maybe the key part of that um and then myself and adam Shear. Um, We'll, we'll introduce it as well, can talk a little bit more detail about some of the data that we've generated at SMUD and, and how, how it's being utilized. So um, by way of just introduction, you know, and I think as Panama said, things are going quickly. I, there is no chance that a year or a year and a half ago, I would have predicted that 60% of all customers of utilities in America are buying from a, a utility with a decar goal, or that we would see, in fact, Frankly, some new zero carbon goals happened in the last week, and I think this 35% is probably low now. So uh, it's a constant battle to keep our PowerPoint up to date, which is awesome. But it's really great to see that, you know, this move towards a focus on GHGs, which is for many of us, what it's always been about, you know, has become really top of mind. Um, and, and is actually driving the, obviously the, the electrification discussion forward, but really across the board, um, a change in utility business model that is both exciting, but also um, something we have to look at very carefully and understand because it really does have many implications. Um, you know, the, we, need, we need stable utilities that remain in business while we decarbonize, and, that, and that's kind of the key point here. So, uh, Scott, are you, just uh, wanna say hello before I hand it off to you. Are you uh, able to unmute? Mr. Blanc? Can, uh, yeah, add, how's that? That sounds great. Is that that's you, Scott? Yeah, it's me. Fabulous. All right. Well, this was going to be a really quick and a uh, nice seamless transition to the next slide where Scott <laughs> can kind of weigh in, but uh, we, the timing is off, but still go for it, Scott. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, we, um, so this is, Kind of starting off of where, where SMUD's at and a little bit about how we got here. So where we're at right now is we, we are the first utility in the United States, uh, we believe, to have avoided carbon as a metric for our energy efficiency programs. Go to the next slide. And this is just a little bit about who SMUD is, and I'm not going to dwell on it. We are electric-only utility in uh, 60 miles east of San Francisco in California. Go to the next slide. And the there was really kind of the, the three steps to getting to this metric is the first thing we did was we made a decision to to claim electrification savings or gas savings uh, as energy efficiency, uh, as specifically as electric electrical efficiency or saving kilowatt hours. And we did that on a carbon basis. Um, after that, and, and so we started claiming those savings as to meet our energy efficiency goals. After that, the board set, the, the organization uh, who's run by a board has set the IRP goal of a 
zero net carbon by 2045 um, or 2040, sorry. And then, uh, and, and then now we have uh, the board in January set a metric for uh, for all our programs to be in uh, measured in carbon. The next slide. So kind of just a slide on those three steps, or at least the first two steps. This claiming kilowatt hour savings through gas reduction. The first, we, we use a carbon equivalence to convert therms to kilowatt hours. And what that is, is, is kind of what's the carbon intensity of our electricity um, and, and the, the carbon intensity of gas and how you convert those two. Today, uh, that is at 24 kilowatt hours per therm. And that's specific to SMUD uh, and our generation, and it, it will change every year. So today it's 24. The slide shows 19.8. That was back a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, and and then as it increases, once we get to like 90% RPS, that would be something like 138 kilowatt hours per therm. This um, in comparison to the just if you just did the engineering math, it'd be about 29. So that's where we're where we're at. Uh, the next slide will show. Uh, this is the SMUDS or this is the SMUDS IRP goal. And go ahead and hit uh, the, or move forward. Yeah. So um, what this is saying is that. We are going to hit a zero carbon, a net zero carbon goal by 2040. Uh, this assumes there's going to be some carbon emissions from our electricity still by 2040. We're netting it out by doing more building and more vehicle electrification uh, to get to zero. To zero. So about a th what this means is about a third of uh, all the carbon savings is going to come from buildings. That means we're going to go from 17% all electric buildings to 80% by 2040. And and kind of an important point is this predated SB 100, which set more aggressive decarbonization goals from electricity. So we think um, I would pose it that by 2040 we'll have less carbon on in our electricity than what what we assumed there. And so the last step on this was really moving to a carbon goal for the organization. And how, how we did that, it, it took a bunch of uh, kind of fits and starts inside the organization to, to bring people along. And really, uh, ultimately, what we found to be very important was to kind of rebrand electrification as energy efficiency and make it kind of the third leg on the stool where SMUD has always run electrical efficiency programs. We just called them energy efficiency. Um, and we let the gas company in our area run natural gas efficiency programs, who what they also called energy efficiency. And real, we really felt that electrification efficiency is really what the CPUC was talking about when they rewrote the three prong test. They were really talking about electrification efficiency and really brought electrification into the fold of energy efficiency. And that's really important because I, because of really the next slide, Oh, I guess I changed order of the slide, but um, but here, go, let's go to the next slide real quick and we'll go back. Because this slide uh, scared a lot of energy efficiency people because, or, or maybe it didn't, but I got the feeling that a lot of people were worried that electrification was gonna take over energy efficiency. And that's kind of what this slide shows that most of the carbon savings is going to be coming from inter from electrification and not from energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is really the blue here. And uh, and really we we don't we want to bring along those people who've been working on energy efficiency for years and I'm one of them. Um, they have the experience what we're really doing is bringing more money to their budgets. And we wanted them to kind of see it 
in that light, that we're bringing money to their budgets. And, and it is just a piece of energy efficiency. And um, go ahead and advance Matt. Uh, I guess go back, go back, sorry. Not seamless. Um, so, so we really kind of rebranded electrification as, as energy efficiency. Um, we tried to rebrand electrification as energy efficiency, and, um, and and by and and once we did that, we were able to set this metric. And what the metric really is is it's a it measures avoided carbon emissions in terms of long run marginal, um, and it's very specific to Smuds Grid and our long run forecast of emissions. And it's carbon only. It's not a GHG metric. Uh, it only measures carbon. So it, it, it ignores refrigerants and it ignores uh, methane emissions are the kind of the two big ones that are not here. This is really about avoided carbon. Um, and I won't get into it, but we think that at this time anyway, this is a fine metric. We can kind of uh, not be looking at those other two at the same time. And we think that's fine. And what the metric really is, what it really tries, what it really focuses on is, is not about saving electricity, uh, but about when we save electricity. Because now it's about when we save electricity, um, not just about saving it. And the graph on, on the right there is really showing that. Feta. And there's also some white cheddar actually that I bought that um, could for Jack that. Um, all right we got the white cheddar cheese discussion going on in the background um anyway the 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 slide on the right uh is just showing uh grid emissions uh average grid emissions on a, a weekday summer hourly marginal and it's just showing really how how much lower they're getting over time and kind of and and the temporal aspect of when we save electricity is going to be just very important so that's what this other metric gives us is the temporal aspect then you advance the slides and then one more time um okay so this is going on to kind of these are the results of this carbon tool that we we produced um, uh, with the help of E3 on the carbon tool. And what it's telling us is, is show this first one is a heat pump water heater in 2020, 2030, and 2040, and and the HVAC. Um, and it's okay to show both of those at the same time. And those both grow over time. There's more carbon. It's and it, again, this is long run marginal carbon emissions. Um, there's more over time because the electricity is getting cleaner. Uh, and, and really looking at this in terms of this is like a heat pump water heater. This is 11 tons in 2020. This is the sum of the life. So the lifetime we had used is 13 years for this. So um, if you look at that, if you look at the sum of the life of a tree, that's 2.6 tons. Uh, and that's over 40 years. So induction. Uh, is not a big winner, uh, right? It doesn't save much carbon. It gets slightly better over time, and it's it's incredibly costly way to do it. Um, going down with a couple of EE measures here as an example, the whole house fan, uh, it goes down over time because you're only saving electricity. There's no gas savings there to be had. And in 2020, it's, and for both of those, whole house fan and AC, they're, not out of the range of saving carbon on a dollars per ton and this is kind of looking at it from a not exactly the rim perspective but mostly a, a rim test is is how this was calculated and then the last one on this slide matt if you want to go forward um just showing pv has really good carbon savings today and as the grid gets cleaner, kind of look, thinking about that last curve, um, when it saves energy, 
is going to be when the grid is the cleanest. So the amount of carbon solar saves, and this is again lifetime, 20 year lifetime, uh, diminishes greatly over time. Uh, yeah, so just putting them in perspective, it's better to, um, in, a, in a carbon sense anyway, it would be more useful to change out your water heater to a, uh, to a, a heat pump water heater over time than it would be to, to add, add PV. Now, PV has other advantages and bill savings and stuff, but from just a carbon savings, uh, adding PV on your roof, which is equivalent to about a, a heat pump water heater, and we all need a water heater. Our water heaters will go out and have to be replaced, so it's kind of uh, just an interesting perspective. Um, and then, thank you, this is my last slide. So, uh, and then I think we'll pause here and probably take some questions. But, um, so, so what this is really showing. So the blue line is showing the winter peak of 3.3 .3 kilowatts uh, in the morning, and it's got an afternoon peak too. But it compares it to the orange and the gray lines of what our peak is. So the orange is what our peak is now, something around 3.9 kilowatts. Uh, and this is for a, a home, right? And post retrofit, it goes down to 3.4. So what it's really saying is that our, we will have a new winter peak, which is the blue line or of somewhere around 3.3 for an all electric home which will be about equivalent to our new um, summer peak of 3.44 kilowatts. And the reason between the difference between the orange and the gray is really showing that, you know, every time we electrify space heating, we get an air conditioner kind of by accident, a new more efficient air conditioner by accident. And so at the same time that we're electrifying space heating, we are uh, making, we are, we are reducing our summer peak at the same time. Uh, so adding grid capacity at the same time. Now, uh, so we're kind of going to, we're going to shift to more a dual peaking utility. Um, what this is, this is showing a average house. This is not the entire grid. So what it doesn't include is, is a commercial on here, but uh, the looks of it so far, um, the, it looks pretty good so far on what we think we're going to do. And, uh, and a lot of this work was done through uh, the work with the, uh, I'm sorry, with Recurve on, on this slide, where it was really showing the benefits of how uh, of what heat pumps are going to do. This is using a lot of uh, pre-data and analyzing it with post-data and and Matt will be able to kind of explain this and add a much better than I can about how this all works. And it's a lot of data that was, a lot of work that was also done with the two of them and Margaret. And uh, maybe we pause for questions or Matt, do you want to pick up and run? Um, sure. So I'm, I'm seeing a few questions come through. Why don't I just ask them of you? Uh, one question okay. around uh, just the combination of PV and storage, and if you got it, and if there's any data that you're aware of on how that affects GHGs at this point. Yeah, I, we have not done that yet. Um, to to look at anything in the tool, I need a load shape and. It wouldn't be that hard to do. I just haven't been, had the time to be able to do a combination of solar and storage to see what the carbon savings would be. Good question. Great. Um, there's also a question, and again, I think some of this, I may not answer, I may not ask all these questions. I think we're going to cover some of them deeper in the rest of the presentation. Um, but some questions really around, uh, from Kyle in particular, around interactive effects, I would say, like, what, how do we think about, you know, PV when combined with whole house electrification. Um, and again, I think we can cover some of that going forward as well, but um, you know, how, how, do these, how do these different measures interact when you do them in the same place at the same time? Well, um, the, the, our peak, right, right now we don't, we, 
obviously solar works with electrification well um, and, or, and vice versa, right? Because you're generating your own electrons. But really the, the issue, if you look at even these two peaks, the, 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 the winter peak is before the sun comes up and the summer peak is when the sun's setting. So um, although the, the summer peak is gonna be coincident with your PV system. So uh, it's going to help on the summer peak for sure. Um, but the difference is gonna be storage, right? Um, so solar on itself, uh, on its own, isn't really gonna help on this daily, uh, on this daily look. Uh, but then there's also the annual. And I don't know, I'll leave it at that. And we, we can follow up offline. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna pick it up here. There's lots of good questions. I think we're gonna cover a lot, at least aspects of many of these questions. So I'm gonna keep moving. Um, so first of all, I just wanna take a pause. Margaret Sheridan's on the call. She's not presenting today, but you know, she, she actually just retired, but has been doing a lot of this work for us. So we, with us through the years. Um, both helping working with Recurve and the SMUD team to get the data necessary to the analysis you're about to see. But we just wanted to do a call out because like, frankly, the work we do only happens when we have great customers who are engaged. And Margaret was definitely that. So we wanted to thank her for uh, her contributions and um, we're still not totally letting her off the hook in retirement either. But she played a really large role in helping us even develop the methods. You know, it's one thing to actually do the analysis, but there's a whole other part of how do you do this analysis in a really credible way? And that requires real data and digging in. This is, this is not uh, simple math fundamentally. So one of the things at a high level that Margaret was actually very involved in that differentiates this work is that it's open source. The methods and the code base that is used to create these hourly baselines that's measuring the impact on the grid uh, is all transparent. And that's a really key part of thinking about how to deploy any of these solutions is that the math, we need to be able to show our work and we need to be able to confident because we're calculating baseline conditions and we're doing that on an hourly basis. Uh, so Margaret, not only did we, we're able to use a lot of data from SMUD to test and we had someone really engaged on the other side, but Margaret was part of the ongoing stakeholder process around both the open EE meter and the Caltrack methods, which are part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, encourage folks who are interested on the technical side to get involved. It's an ever improving process. Um, but this notion that I wanna put out there of revenue grade calculations, where it's not a black box is fundamentally critical for integration in the grid and frankly, just in general, to make this whole thing work. We, we gotta show our work and be transparent. Um, and it led to just a whole bunch of really fun analysis. And I'm gonna show some highlights of it, but looking at how heat pumps actually impact grids, um, and there's really two sides to that. You've heard reference to E3 and Recurve. In simple terms, E3 did a lot of work with SMUD to figure out what, and this is something everybody needs to do, what is the marginal intensity in a given hour of GHGs for a kilowatt hour? And that's, we have numbers I'll show you for the state, but it really varies by utility. And if we're not, we don't know what GHGs are on an hourly locational marginal basis, we're shooting in the dark. What we are looking at is something a little different, which is when you put in a heat pump, how does that change demand? And what is that delta, which we, you'll, you'll, we reference as resource curve quite often? How did, how did the heat pump affect demand behind that meter? And it's actually the combination of those two things that tell you what the impact is on the climate, right? Did we reduce or increase demand? And when we did that, how did that affect GHGs in that hour? Um, averages don't work for this kind of math. You can get entirely the wrong answer. So we had a lot of fun with Margaret and the whole team actually over the years looking backwards at a ton of programs. Um, some are heat pump programs, some were energy efficiency programs and really ground truthing. You know, what do these things do to hourly impacts to demand so that we can think about what are those impacts from a climate perspective and what are those impacts uh, from a GHG perspective as well. So again, thank you, Margaret. And we're sad to see you go. Um, but we're, again, we may not totally let you off the hook either. Um, and this is kind of what you get though on those marginal, this is, you know, very much the type of work that SMUD has, and I'll show you their numbers here in a second, but this is the statewide marginal hourly change in, uh, of GHG impacts per kilowatt hour. And this is really critical for all of this thinking. I mean, at a basic level, we're trying to use the green stuff and less of the red stuff. And, uh, thank you, Eric, you did make that graph. Thank you for this graph. This is another version of that graph. That's the SMUD version and it's similar, right? And you can see over time we're getting cleaner. Uh, but there's still periods of time, especially those mor mornings in the winter that are pretty hard to clean up, right? Like getting clean electrons to 6 a.m. when these heat pumps are firing is 
a challenge. And it's a challenge we can surmount, but we need to look it in the eye and think systemically about how we both transition from gas to electric, which has GHG impacts that we like, especially if they're accounted for properly, kind of out the gate. But getting to zero is a different story. Um, well, not a different story. It's a larger story. Right? It's not just, you know, general decline is great, but we're trying to get to zero on the grid. So somehow we got to make this whole grid zeros um, before too long. So, you know, just some high level stuff, and I'm sure I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but this is the problem, right? We are over generating solar to such a large degree that on a given day, it's highly likely we're paying Arizona to, to curtail solar and we're paying Air, uh, Oregon to shut off hydro and we're paying them to take solar from us. Um, and we curtail almost a terabyte, almost 965 gigawatt hours of renewables in California last year. Um, and so it's really expensive. And, you know, the challenge is like, we got to deal with that ramp and the peaks, right? We have more clean electrons in the valley, in the belly than we know what to do with. Um, and so that's kind of this broader notion of how do we integrate heat pumps and energy efficiency and demand response and storage and EVs into a solution that gets us to zero. Um, and fundamentally, there's lots of solutions out there, and it's going to take all of them, by the way, um, and maybe some we've never thought of, in our opinion. Um, but there's a lot of grid side solutions. But then when you do the math, you find that you just can't find enough flexibility at a cost that makes any sense, but even available on just the grid side alone. So the thing that we're really focused on, and we've been working on with SMUD and in general, is how do we think in a unified way around bringing flexibility behind meters to the table in a unified field theory that actually makes sense. How do we, how do utilities take advantage of behind the meter flexibility in whatever form it comes, whether that's a heat pump or an insulated attic or a smart thermostat or a car charging in the garage, solar plus storage, you name it. But how do they, how do we harness that ability to shift shape and balance uh, to benefit customers? So they'll buy it because you gotta, you gotta solve for the customer, but also co-benefit the grid and climate. And in particular, GHGs. And this is actually what's so amazing about SMUD moving, cutting out the middleman and saying, actually, it's about GHGs. Because uh, one thing we all need to remember is that utility avoided costs and rates aren't really aligned with GHGs. We have this night problem, right? Nights are cheap, but they're actually full of GHGs. So in general, if, we wanna, if we're trying to get to zero, which I think that's what we're doing here, let's focus on the metric that really matters and value it properly. Because it's one of the challenges we have is that GHGs aren't valuable enough on our grid uh, when you do the math, right? So it doesn't drive necessarily the behavior that we're looking for writ large. So um, these are some of the big questions. And you know, how you know we can't just keep doing what we're doing. We have to see massive scale increases. Demand has to go up, right? And to do that, we need to figure out more cost-effective ways to get there, right? And that doesn't mean, you know, and we'll talk about some ways to, to improve that cost effectiveness, but not in a regulatory sense, but in just a real world sense, right? How do we generate demand and how do we do that in a way we can actually afford to pay for? You know, huge incentives for water heaters make a ton of sense maybe right out the gate, but they can't persist forever. So what's that transition look like? Um, and then how do we take our programs or the markets that are being created and really optimize around both grid values and carbon values? Because they actually are both important, right? We need to reduce GHGs, but we also need a stable grid at the same time. Um, and so how do we think about those mutual grid and climate benefits in a way um, that drives the right behavior? So I'm gonna hand this over now to go through some of the more detailed data that we have. Again, thanks to the work we did with SMUD on specifically uh, what we're seeing in heat pumps. I'm gonna let Adam Shear give, uh, give, give out that information. He did a lot of the work on it. Um, some of you or many of you may know Adam. He brings a pretty interesting set of experiences to the table. You know, at PG&E, where he was prior to Recurve, he ran, um, he was on the evaluation team and the policy team, and he ran residential programs. So he kind of has all, all sides of, the, of this equation. Um, but with that, um, hopefully, Adam, you have your mute off, and I'll turn it over to you to uh, talk about the kind of the approach and also uh, what we found. Thanks, Matt. Can folks hear me okay? Sounds fine to me. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Scott did a great job laying out how SMUD is transitioning to greenhouse gas as the corresponding metric to, for their residential and demand side portfolio in general. And the question that we're really trying to answer is helping connect the dots between this GHG forecast that they now have, which is a really unique thing and a wonderful thing to have at the utility side, to the actual meter-based impacts of electrification. And they have a very unique data set that was available to us where 
uh, this is kind of a, a researcher's dream. They had almost a thousand heat pump installations in single family homes that were uh, only heat pump installations. So there weren't a lot of extra measures or extra things done to the households. Uh, so it gives us a very clean look at what the impact of a heat pump was upon installation in a real home. Um, so we had 713 of these projects that we ended up incorporating into this analysis, all single family home heat pump installations. Um, as Matt talked about, we uh, computed hourly um, uh, load impacts from all of these uh, projects. And we're able to see uh, with all of this aggregated together, what the average impact of a heat pump installation actually is on the grid. And then with this greenhouse gas forecast that SMUD has available, we're able to uh, roll it into the greenhouse gas calculation itself. So what you're seeing, uh, so one thing I would mention uh, is in order to do this right, all of these projects were electric to electric conversion. So we needed a comparison group. So SMUD working with Margaret provided a lot of homes that were gas heating homes. And we created a stratified sampling scheme that we can go into the details later if folks are really interested in. But just wanted to put that out there. That this, is, this wasn't just a apples to apples. We had to um, really dig into this to get what we believe is an accurate uh, load impact assessment of a heat pump installation in a single family home. So we can go to the next slide. So what you're looking at here is the actual 8760 uh, load shape of a heat pump uh, customer, a gas heating customer, and then in orange down below is the impact from the heat pump itself. And you can go to the next uh, figure. Rolling this up really into uh, monthly impacts. And as Scott mentioned earlier, in the winter time, you're going to see increased load. And we're starting to see this winter peaking behavior from heat pump customers. Um, but in the summertime, you can see the dip in May, June, July, August, September you get a more efficient air conditioner, so you actually end up reducing summer peak load uh, because of a heat pump. So we can roll this up into seasonal impacts, and Matt, you can go to the next slide. And what you're seeing here is just the winter uh, demand impact from a heat pump. That's in orange. We've isolated it in orange on an hourly basis for an average heat pump customer, an average day in the winter. And the blue line is the average heat pump customer's load shape. And the green line is the average gas heating customer load shape. Um, and there are a few things I'd point out here that are pretty commonsensical, but it's nice to see and to ha actually have this information available to us because these, again, are real world installations. Um, the heat pump customer shows this behavior where they're heating their home uh, in the winter morning time, right? It's, it's cold, people wake up, they heat their home, they have their thermostat set. And then when the sun comes up in the middle of the day, you start to see this decrease and you see this uh, dip and it's almost like a, in, like a duck curve flipped horizontally. And then in the evening, you see this peak. Um, and the orange is the uh, uh, impact from the heat pump in an isolated way. You can see that it actually would basically double the winter morning load from what a gas heating customer would, would have. So the summertime is an entirely different story. Now the heat pump is acting as a more efficient air conditioning system. And so now the gas heating customer is using more, especially during the uh, midday hours and the early evening hours. And the heat pump is a more efficient air conditioning system. So you see the, the orange curve now it goes below zero. So you're saving energy because of the heat pump. Um, and then of course, the name of the game here is to roll all of this into an 8760 greenhouse gas analysis. Uh, and so what we're not showing here is the impact from actually removing the furnace because that's where the biggest bang for your GHG dollar is going to be. Um, I think uh, average furnace in SMUD territory probably is around 1.5 tons per year of GHG. Uh, but what we're showing here is just the uh, impact on the electric grid and how it's going to change over time. So in 2020, what you see is, uh, if you go back one, Matt, sorry, the across the horizontal of this graph are just the months of the year, January, February through December. And then going down, you see the hours of the day. And that winter morning peak that we're seeing is there in red in January, February in the morning hours. But you see that dark green section is really the summer peak period. That's where we're, the impact of the heat pump itself on the electric grid alone is really saving a lot of carbon. 
But overall in 2020, you know, you add a heat pump, it adds about half of a ton of GHG uh, uh, to, the, to the electric grid. Of course, you're getting that 1.5 tons uh, removed from the furnace. But then as we go over time, we really see why electrification is a key decarbonization strategy. So 2025, we're starting to get greener. 2030, we're much greener. 2035, now we're actually saving GHG on the electric grid by itself from a heat pump installation. And then finally in 2040, uh, we see increased savings from uh, GHG from the heat pump alone. So um, I'll stop there and we can either answer any questions or Matt, if you wanted to cover the, these next few slides. Well, I think I did want to pause here um, to uh, try to try to answer them. There's a lot of great questions here. So I'm trying to sort through how best to uh, handle them without diving down any rabbit holes. But just to sum things up a little bit, um, you know, our opinion in looking at this data is that without a doubt, electrification is a key GHG strategy. Um, but it's not a silver bullet, and, and that's not a negative on, on, on electrification, but we do need to start, we need to think about the integration of heat pumps, you know, for, for HVAC, you know, as well as other end uses like hot water heating, which is, can frankly be a lot more flexible, as I think everybody knows, um, with other traditional, you know, things like energy efficiency. So um, it's really not a, it's not one or the other, it's how you integrate these solutions to achieve really a flattening of the load shape and, a, and an overall reduction in GHGs on the grid. Um, and one way to think about that is, you know, as we create um, a new load shape, right, and we are, and we are driving, you know, an, a, an increase in electric consumption for heating, right, Even, and that will be a benefit overall, and, you know, heat pumps can do that efficiently from a, seat, from a conversion standpoint, from a conversion of electricity to, to heat. Um, but one, one just kind of key metric is, you know, every, our additional R value of insulation that we put in the attic or those ducts that we seal with that HVAC system that we're installing with that heat pump, you know, when it comes to actually getting to zero on the grid, again, those morning hours are challenging and expensive to decarbonize. So, you know, while there's direct GHG savings, which we can quantify, there's also grid avoided cost values that can be, in some cases, much more valuable than the straight GHGs, especially with how we're valuing GHGs today. Um, so thinking about insulating an attic, every kilowatt hour we shave at six in the morning is likely avoiding some future uh, KW of renewables or solar that we have to install, optimized for winter production, and potentially 12 hours of battery storage. So you know, as we put in these heat pumps and think about designing programs that get us to zero, um, it's really not a dichotomy. It's not efficiency or you know, or electrification. It's really how do we integrate this stuff? And then also with storage and you know, strategies around getting our EVs to charge in beneficial ways and everything else we're doing. Um, and so we really do think that SMUD is on the right track. You know, the, one of the very first things we have to do across the board uh, is cut out the middleman. Again, one of the big concerns I think we and I have personally is when I look at the avoided cost stack in California, but across the globe, but uh, GHGs aren't worth enough. We haven't made them worth enough. And so, you know, honestly, it's, it becomes not chasing real GHG reductions for the marketplace and the customer doesn't make the, as much sense as it should because um, we're not putting enough value on it currently. And the other piece is that if we're going to build programs and focus on decarbonization, we have to make sure that we're measuring it correctly. And that means average KWH reductions and average intensity of the grid in GHGs can send you in totally the wrong direction. Um, a simple example of this that we've, we've written about previously is um, based on when savings happen, a megawatt hour in California of, of demand reduction coming from a residential HVAC retrofit versus a commercial lighting program generates currently 65% more GHG reductions coming from that residential efficiency, which is, has everything to do with when those savings happen. So it's really critical that we kind of move away from thinking kind of on averages about cost effectiveness and really specifically measure and focus on the outcomes that we want. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but we also have to move to actually focusing on where our impact is gonna be the largest. Um, you know, not treating everybody equally on an average, but focusing on where the highest potential is in the market. Who are the customers that are gonna benefit the most from an HVAC system retrofit or can actually put in a storage system with their solar solar array or will have good outcomes with a heat pump because um, the, the metrics fundamentally change. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and try to work through some of these questions. Um, so let's see. Um, it so seems here, like I'll take one real quick. Yeah, ahead, um, as, as you as you as you read a few, I'll I'll take one. Uh, they ask about um, does does about managing and managing uh, water heaters. So that's, you know, controlling when they're, they're operating and when they're consuming electricity. We have programs that do that. We, we have controllable heat pump water heater programs running now that have 40 or so water heaters uh, uh, in our territory that we're managing and we're controlling. However, the tool and the carbon savings does not account for that. We we haven't factored that in uh, to the tool yet. So yes, water heaters should save a little more and same thing for space heaters. If, if, but we're not, we don't have, uh, uh, we're not managing heating and cooling at this time, other than through time of use rates, which are time of use rates alone the first summer. Um, there was about a 3% 3 per, 3 reduction in peak that we found. And that was about uh, 13,000 tons of carbon that was saved from just the implementation of time of use rates. And that was just the first summer, but um, that's one of them. Matt, you wanna take the next one? Yeah, I'm seeing a few questions just around the accounting and kind of reflecting on your earlier uh, discussion also just around the metric um, that right now this is looking at carbon from combustion, for example, on the gas side, and it's a fairly direct measurement. Um, I think there's a longer conversation in that we, over time, can definitely look at accounting more fully for life cycle carbon effects that are occurring for things like methane leakage. Um, I think you got to start in, with something nice and quantitative, um, but by all means, you know, this can just get more refined and express more fully those values over time. Um, but it's a bit of a quantum leap to get where we are right now, we feel like. Um, and there is some aspect of like, keep it simple, stupid on the outset. And this is not exactly simple either. But, um, but yeah, I think there's, there's acknowledgement across the board that this accounting process for GHGs can get more and more refined. Um, and once you have that structure in place where you're doing it on a marginal hourly basis, then that can just be updated um, as we get better at accounting for it properly. Margaret asked a good question here around uh, taking into account a refrigerant GHG. And I think that that's something that we haven't yet done, but it's something that we all should be paying attention to because uh, I don't know if folks saw a recent analysis that talked about the short term ways that we can all have an impact on climate change and uh, refrigerant charge GHG and, and like chlor hydro hydrocarbons and things like that can be much more potent greenhouse gases. So these are things that over time we should be working into these analyses. That sounds great. I'm going to take, uh, there's a message from Peter just about thinking about averages versus targeting. And I think that I'll use that as a, there's a little next series of slides. This is totally applicable to thinking about identifying uh, heat pump customers as well. But I'm going to take, we're taking a little bit of a tangent and focus on just more complete data sets we have in residential HVAC efficiency and uh, commercial programs. But one thing I want to just preface, when we use the words targeting, it sounds exclusive. Um, what we're really talking about is identifying customers that will benefit the most from what we're giving them uh, at the end of the day. It's not, it's, not, uh, it's not taking people out of the equation. It's saying if you're not going to benefit from an HVAC retrofit, maybe you would benefit more from a new appliances or lighting or something else. And so one of the fundamental issues that we have, and this is really, really fundamental to our ability to scale, Right, is that if we're gonna decarbonize and electrify, we need to increase everything dramatically. We're just so, so much too small across the board. And I think we all know that. Um, you know, we're, we're on an express train to zero carbon and we gotta get moving. And so just to understand the problem with kind of this average approach that we've been taking, um, and I'll get to the solution next, I promise. But um, when, we, when we deem results in advance, when we say, you know, what is the average impact of a heat pump or the average impact of an HVAC system or a smart thermostat, um, there's a challenge there because in many cases that average, you know, it's really, we're selling to early adopters and the laggards at the same time. And that average is not that cost effective to the customer or the grid. Um, in, in, so the customers on average, you know, you, you see pretty low, potent, in many cases, impacts to bills. And on average, in many cases, we're not cost effective because we've been focused on, you know, again, moving, because we deem these results in advance, 
you know, the incentive for everybody in the market is to get as many customers as possible, not to optimize around best outcomes. So in California in particular, but really in many states across the country now, we have this opportunity in the form of what's called normalized metered energy consumption, at least in the California market, to say, actually, we want to move from deemed averages in advance and instead focus on results at the meter that actually occur that we can measure. These revenue grade calculations of energy savings, but more importantly, time and locational values. And the advantage of targeting highest potential, and I'll show you some actual examples of this, is that you get customers that have drastically more benefits. And I'll show you some like potentially two or three times more bill and reduction benefits and something looking similar and sometimes even greater on the GHG and grid impacts. Because when we say targeting and identifying high potential, we're looking for those customers that actually have an HVAC problem, right? That will, be, again, they'll see personal benefits, but they'll also, the grid benefits will go through the roof. And so from a scale standpoint, you know, as we're launching a product, we got to find the early adopters that actually want our product. And when we do that, we get these remarkably better outcomes at lower prices. So this is actually looking, this is real data collected from the home performance program that SMUD's been running. So this is residential, this is not heat pumps, this is, well, some of these are heat pumps actually, but this is HVAC and Shell primarily. And so the program, um, and this looks very similar to other programs across the board, is you know, saving about 1,000 kilowatt hours, just under, per customer, um, with about 9% savings. The, this, on the left, this red line represents the, when those savings occurred on the electric side, um, oh, during the summer months, right? So you can see what's interesting is like these peaks in residential tend to be very coincidental with the duck, uh, if that makes sense. So we're, we're saving the most in the summer during that ramp period, which makes it pretty, pretty darn valuable. 15% during that peak KW, I should say, 15% KWH re reductions during those peak hours. In terms of finding high potential, this is where the opportunity is, right? So if we look at that and we realize actually what we've been doing is just trying to sell HVAC because that's how everybody's rewarded. But if instead we step back and say, who are the customers that actually benefit the most? And we identify and target them. And in this case, we're looking for the customers that are using, this is the court, the 25% essentially of customers using the most air conditioning during that ramp window, the system peak, which is when it's most valuable to SMUD, on an avoided cost basis, and that's where most of the GHGs are, we can double those customer savings. So in this port, this, this subset of those customers, they're seeing 2x the average, um, they're and they're seeing 3x the savings during the peak and getting much deeper savings at the same time. So these are customers that we're solving real problems for, cash flow, and are much more valuable to the grid. So we can afford to incentivize them at a higher rate and drive more demand. Um, and then on an avoided cost basis, this is the average program itself. They're saving for the life cycle of a customer $2,300 in avoided cost value across GHGs, capacity, T&D, energy, losses, et cetera. So this is what these customers are actually worth across their useful life to, the, to SMUD on average. And again, that top quarter of the customer base, which is a huge segment of the population, who we know and we know who these people are in advance, have a much bigger impact. Right, so those customers are worth more, basically double to pg e or to SMUD in this case, sorry, um, the average customer. So not only are these customers seeing markedly better results on their meter, they're happier, they're more likely to say yes, but we can actually afford to incentivize them at a higher rate, which is what we need to drive early demand uh, and still come out ahead on the cost effectiveness basis. So, you know, we can either spend more money and get better results, or we can take current budgets and optimize them and get much better outcomes for the same budget uh, when it comes to the grid and GHG reductions. Um, it's also useful across categories. This is again, a commercial program, same, same type of trend, right? So we have uh, the baseline on the left. So this is how these commercial customers used energy. And on the right, we have what we call, again, call resource curves. So this is how they saved energy. Um, so left is usage, right is savings from the intervention in this program, the CES program. So when we target the 40% of customers, right, that have the load, the load shape usage, where they're actually the ones using energy during that peak window that we care the most about, because that's where the GHGs are, and the avoided costs, uh, we're getting a lot more savings in that peak window. These customers not only are saving more themselves, but they're worth a lot more. And so essentially we're doubling those peak savings, which means we're seeing markedly higher GHG reductions at the same time. Um, and so, you know, just in general, you know, using this type of an approach is just critical to 
all of our efforts. You know, we have to actually identify where heat pumps will make the most sense. Where does insulation going to work the best? Who's the best candidate for a smart thermostat? Um, and really think about identifying those customers. And um, you really, the way to think about this is there's, there's no equity in convincing a customer to retrofit a building and have their bills go up after the fact. Um, and this can also just, by the way, be layered on with social justice style equities when it comes to like helping low income customers. Um, it's really a different part of the equation, but there's a fundamental that if we're going to use ratepayer money to try to decarbonize, we need to use it as wisely as possible to achieve the best possible results. And when we do that, you know, we get programs that are much more cost effective, which means we can invest more in them, get better outcomes, and we can scale. Um, and that brings us to, uh, with a few minutes left, the end of the presentation. Um, I think we can stay on for a little bit longer answering questions. Um, I'll, I'll, I've been actually talking here, so I'll leave it to Scott and Adam if anything is spooling by on the question and answers. We can also take, I think, some of these offline if we don't get to all of them right now. Um, but did you guys see anything that you'd want to comment on go by? Yeah, I see, uh, you know, Peter Turnbull, who's been a long standing leader in thoughts on electrification and how we can actually structure programs to move markets, is weighing in. And uh, Peter, nice to see you here. I think. You're making some good points around the need to build markets, um, but I don't see them as necessarily antithetical to also finding the customers who stand to benefit. You know, when we look at gas data, we see that a whole bunch of customers really have very little temperature dependent usage. If you're installing a heat pump for replacement of a space heating system, those customers probably aren't going to benefit. It's not a good investment for them. So I think it's it, what helps build markets is not only getting contractors trained, getting uh, programs up and running, but it's also finding the customers who actually will benefit and getting that word of mouth and making things cost effective for the utility. That's where we've failed in the past. That's the opportunity now. Yeah. And you're talking to folks that yeah, love, and, by the way, this just, this is going to apply to programs and, and it equally applies to markets. Yeah. And, and today, this is Scott and Smud. And today, you know, we're offering our programs uh, across the board for everyone. Um, but being able to target means a, that the customers, you know, if we can get more from uh, this targeted population that are going to save more and receive more benefits, they're going to be better uh, advocates for electrification as well, right? We, we're going to get those results. They're going to help propel the movement um, as opposed to uh, if, if we do it the other way and there's, you know, maybe they receive comfort and safety and health benefits, but their bills don't go down. Uh, it, it's, it's a different message. So, I think it's a way that we can help propel the movement by uh, by focusing our marketing on a certain group of people, um, but but also it's a way for us to hit our carbon goal by spending less money, hopefully, in the short term. So we can both propel the movement and uh, reduce our budgets. That's exactly right. I want to just make clear when we talk about equity, we can, it's a bit of a confusing term because there's really two primary types. So ratepayer equity on one hand is spending our joint money wisely to get a resource impact and GHG reductions. The other form of equally important equity is social equity, you know, helping low income customers and these can totally coexist. Um, you know, but we do need to acknowledge that, you know, if we're trying to get the least cost GHGs that that sends us in one direction. And then by all means, you know, as we have goals to help low income customers, and that's super valuable, um, we can layer that on top and, you know, make a decision to pay more to help low income customers. And that's, that's great too. These are not exclusive concepts. Um, but in both cases, we want to make sure we're maximizing the impact that we're having. So I'd also mention, there's just, I'll touch this last one, and I think we're kind of low on time, but the, the gaming of the system, um, is actually very handleable in this model uh, as you move into when you're tracking performance fundamentally and you're also we're, when we're talking about you know act, and I guess this is not intrinsic necessarily in, a, in, in this approach if you're taking a programmatic approach you can kind of doesn't have to look drastically different than current programs this is really kind of up to how it gets implemented in a market-based approach which I think Eli is referring to in his comment where it's pay for performance um, you know, the, the payment structures that we're seeing in, in pay for performance programs are not direct to customer because we want to align the incentives. We want the market participants developing products to also benefit in the same way as their customers. So they have the same incentive structure. Um, and so, you know, there's not a lot of incentive for customers to game. 
Um, and ultimately, you know, we have so much data, it's actually in compared to traditional programs in any frame, um, it's very hard to game the sort of system without leaving fingerprints. And so we don't see that as a very large uh, issue at all. And actually quite a bit less gameability than traditional programs where there's no real data. With that, I think we are at the hour. Um, I don't know, but if, before we close out here, if there's any, any last words from either of our participants or also from Panama, if you wanted to close things up. Um, and we can also take a look at these uh, questions coming in uh, and potentially answer some of them uh, in written form or, or, or direct, as we know many of you, um, if that helps after the, after the fact. Just one quick last thought for me, and that's to say thank you to Smud and to Margaret again, because um, I think having these kinds of data available are things that we can all learn from, and oftentimes they're not shared widely, and Smud has been willing to, to do that with us here, and I think it's gonna benefit everybody. So thank you, Scott, thank you, Smud, for that opportunity. And yes, I, at least, I, I, I assume it's true for SMUD, but we're happy to share this presentation, uh, probably in a PDF form. Um, and I think the recording will be out there as well. Panama, any last words? And we'll let people get back well, to their day. Oh, sorry. You actually get Ashley instead of Panama now, but I wanted yeah. to jump in and thank both SMUD and Riker for your time today. This has been great. Excellent. All right, well, thank you for putting it on. Ashley, Panama, the DCAR Coalition, and everybody who stuck with us. Thanks, guys. Um, Have a good day. Sorry for missing your email there, Scott. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.